Hi there, and welcome to uh, Weird Shit episode 6, I believe it is. Um, this is going to be called Shading Shenanigans, and um, I'm going to split this one up into two parts. So people have been requesting shading stuff for a while now, and I'm finally getting around to doing so. And in the first part, I'm going to keep this very simple, um, just explain some of the basics of shading and how I approach things, and some of the simple things you can do within cycles. Um, and the second part will be a little bit more advanced, um, be more about, I guess, procedural texturing, that kind of thing. But the reason I'm splitting them up is so I have two sort of nice parts that you can go on, depending on what it is that you'd like to learn. So with that being said, um, let's just let's dive right in and talk a little bit about the scene that I have here. So I have a very basic scene, I'll show you right here. Um, I have three monkey meshes and we're going to do some exercises on those today. I have a studio floor, which is just very huge, and I have a camera. Uh, if I hit render, you'll see that we have uh, an HDRI loaded in. This is an HDRI from the Blender Cloud, and you'll be able to download this final file to have a look at yourself and everything will be included. Um, so let's get started, shall we? So I tend to do a lot of my shading in uh, rendered view, and the reason for that is it's just so much quicker. Uh, Cycles allows you to do so very, very easily uh, just by hitting Shift Z in the viewport, and it makes everything um, a lot easier to work with, and you can see your results immediately, which is definitely a plus. Now, if you have a second screen, for example, if I just hit Shift Z here to turn off the render view, we can do is hold down Shift and click on the uh, the little sort of resize um, icon up in the corner and you can get a second viewport. Now what I like to do when I'm working is uh, sort of drag this off to my second screen and put it over there full screen. Just leave it on rendered and that way I can work in a 3D view here and see my final result um, on the other screen. Obviously I'm going to keep everything on this screen for this uh, tutorial so let's dive right in. So the first thing I want to talk about really quick is um, this idea of using the Uber shader or principled shader in Blender versus building your own shaders. So I'm using a test build of 2.79 at the moment. It should be out fairly soon. Um, and I think by the time most of the, most people see this tutorial, they'll have either tried uh, downloading the test build themselves or grabbed the 2.79 release. So what do I mean by this? Well, in a lot of other applications and render engines, if I go down to shader here, in my node view and I bring up the principled, you get something similar to this. So this is what's called an uber shader or um, in our case the principled shader. So this is taken from a bunch of papers that were written over at Disney and that they um, use for their own PBR workflow and it's been implemented into Blender. Now the thing is I have nothing against shaders like this per se. Um, one of the reasons though that drew me to cycles to begin with was actually the fact that you can build your own shaders from scratch and I would advise learning how to do so first before jumping into this because you'll get a way better understanding of what's actually going on under the hood and um, why some of the stuff, this theory, this shading theory is actually quite important to know um, if you want to do really nice shading and get nice results. That being said, um, if you just want to jump right in, I'm going to connect this up. So if you watch some of my tutorials, I use the um, Node Wrangler add-on that's in the add-ons menu and I hit Control shift to uh, click and sort of easily uh, connect this up to the surface of the material output. If I have, let's say a texture, and I'm just gonna show you very quickly, hit Shift Z here for a second. Um, let's say I have a texture or magic texture or something, and you can hit color as well if you really want to, but um, that way it's just connecting it up and you get a nice little preview of that node. If you do it on a shader, then it just shows the shader. Something very simple, but very nice nonetheless. Now, I have this principled BSDF shader, and I'm going to look at the base color here. You can obviously change the base color, and if you want, um, change down the roughness a little bit so it becomes a little bit more, there we go, a little bit more shiny. And this gives really, really nice results off the bat. Um, the cool thing about the principled shader is that it's going to give you perfectly sort of realistic um, PBR and all that jazz, and uh, you won't have to think about it too much. The reason that I don't always use it, or that I don't always like it as much, is it gives you less control. So I like pulling apart these shaders and doing crazy crap with them, and the principle make this, makes this a little bit harder to do. Um, but then again, you know, if you just want to use it, I'll run over it very quickly. You've got a little metallic slot, which changes it from more of a plasticky to a metallic-y look. Um, where are we? You've got the transmission that will actually change it to a glassy look, and set the base color back to 
regular white. So you see um, it can be somewhere in between the two. So now we've got this metallic sort of looking glass if we really want to um, turn that turn down the transmission again. We go back to sort of a plasticky looking shader. And honestly, you can play with these yourself. Uh, the roughness is how rough the reflections are. But these are also, these are all coupled together. So that's something that I myself don't really like all that much. Um, I prefer that I have individual control over these parameters. So that's why I tend to build my own shaders. That being said, if I'm working with other people and I wanna make sure all of this stuff is very easily transferable, and um, maybe some of the people that I'm working with aren't that experienced in shading and prefer something like this, then I'll go ahead and use this. It's perfectly fine. It works really, really well. And kudos to the Blender developers for uh, putting this in. It's a really nice implementation. Um, one of the nicest ones I've worked with so far, and it works quite well. So again, if we go into metallic here, you see we up the roughness. And this is a really nice example of why I don't like this as much. Um, the metallic is linked to the base color, which is normal for metals, but I like to have control over both the base color and the glossiness separately. So let's do that now. I'm gonna take away this principal shader for now, and we're left with this empty slot. And uh, I'm just gonna zoom in, and we start with the diffuse shader. So a diffuse shader is basically the color. This is the easiest way to remember it. Um, it's just a flat shader. As you'll see, you're not getting any reflections or anything inside of this. It's just a colored shader. And if we leave this to whatever color, let's set it to like bright blue or whatever, um, then that's all that's gonna happen. So to actually get this to reflect, so to make it look like a basic plastic shader, as we saw in the principal shader, um, I'm gonna use a mix shader, bring it in here, and a glossy shader. So this is what I was talking about. You kind of need to know all the different components and how to mix them together because even if I turn the roughness way down on this, it still doesn't look 100% right. Now, there's a bunch of different nodes you can use and the first one people might be inclined to use is the Fresnel node. Now, the Fresnel node works okay um, even though it's more intended for internal reflections and I would have you uh, advise against using this for a surface shader. It works just fine if you just want to uh, start working on that. Now, what is Fresnel? Maybe that's a better question because I know um, a lot of this stuff for me, I've been doing the shading kind of thing for years and years now, and a lot of this is sort of second nature, and I know a lot of people are sort of confused by what's going on here. That's very simple. I'm actually going to go into Google right now, see if I can bring this up and type in Fresnel. This is going to be a very quick lesson see if I can get a Wikipedia entry on here. There we go. So the person that first thought of this concept was uh, Augustin Jean Fresnel. Way back when in the, uh, where are we? Somewhere between the 17 and the 1800s, which is really crazy when you think about it, that this sort of um, mathematical, these ideas have been around for so long and people have figured this out for quite some while. Now, basically, what he um, looked at and we theorized, uh, which is something that you see here very easily, is basically as you're looking at a surface, um, and this is all derived from his work, obviously, uh, when you're looking at a surface, then if you're looking sort of head on to something and you're um, perpendicular facing towards it, you'll see a lot less um, a lot less glossiness and a lot less uh, reflection. And if you're looking at it at sort of a grazing angle, as you can see, we're looking at it sort of almost at a 90 degree angle here, we get a lot of reflections. Now, if I take this out, this diffuse component, you can see exactly what's going on. We just have the glossy and the shader itself inside is just black. If I were to take the glossy and hook it up to the surface here, this is what happens when it reflects 100% all around. And the reason it looks so nice is because of that HDR and because of this studio floor and everything. Now what happens when I hook this mix shader up again, we just have the glossy in there. You can see that indeed on the side now we're getting these sort of glossy reflections and from the front we're not getting any at all. Now I'm not going to get too uh, in depth into this. If you like this kind of stuff, you can always look it up. There's plenty of really, um, really interesting papers on this that you can read. But basically this Fresnel component is making sure that we, um, we mix our diffuse and our glossy correctly. Now these two components you can build I don't know, 70, 80% of your shader is easy with just these two in the right Fresnel value. Uh, and there's some special ones that you have to, have to add in. But it just goes to show that 
this is a really big difference. And if we want something to look non-metallic, sort of plasticky, but have reflections, we have to use Fresnel. Now, if we bump this Fresnel value up, you'll see that the higher it goes, the more the uh, frontal reflection will start popping up and the less the effect is uh, on the mesh itself. Now, something else cool that we can do, if we set this back to the default, um, we can actually see this happening in the Fresnel shader itself. So this is what you're getting. Basically, you're using this as a mask and you're saying, all right, everything that's sort of front facing is gonna be dark gray and everything that's gonna be gray at a grazing angle is gonna be light gray. So that's exactly what it does. And now you see um, exactly why it's mixing the way it is and why it's making it look correct. Now, if I bump this up, you'll see this gets wider and wider. Basically, it's going to diminish the um, difference or at least sort of bring down the difference between the front angle and the side. And you get more reflections, which is exactly what we'll see if we plug this back in a higher Fresnel or a lower Fresnel, anything <clears throat> sort of between one and one point eight two something like that look fairly normal and then as we push it up we get sort of weird results and it starts looking almost metallic so this is a very short introduction into fresnel and i remember i said that this one generally is used for internal reflections well the reason i would advise using this one first i'm going to open up google again is we have this website called refractive index.info Maybe if I spelled it right, there we go. And basically you've got a whole bunch of, um, I guess, a whole bunch of materials in here. It's one giant material database. So let's have a look at maybe simple inorganic materials and let's grab something like plastic, some kind of plastic maybe. All right. See, I know nothing about all this um, all this really scientific stuff. So let's see, oh, 3D, select the data for 3D artists. So they've updated this since I've used it last. There we go. So I've got some plastics and we'll grab just a very basic, basic plastic, I don't know, polystyrene, something like that. All right, so this is gonna have a refractive index of 1.57. So um, refractive index or index of refraction. If we go back here, that's what IOR means. It means index of refraction. Uh, if we put this into like 1.57, then we get sort of a normal plasticky looking uh, thing. So you can use it this way, especially if you're getting used to mixing your own shaders, I would advise uh, just trying this out and getting a feel for it. And then um, a lot of people, so let's hit control X here and delete that. And then once you get on, uh, a little bit further, you can start using this layer weight and basically you'll see the Fresnel option here and it does almost exactly the same thing. Um, it's just more optimized for surface shading and the blend here is, um, yeah, sort of what you're gonna control it with. So a higher number is gonna blend it more. So going up to one, you get almost completely sort of metal looking things and going down to zero, you get almost nothing. Again, we can preview this and you can see exactly the same thing is happening. Um, I believe this one's just a little bit more advanced and works a little bit better with uh, surface shading. The only drawback is that you don't have the actual index of refraction value. Now, the funny part of this is that once I learned sort of to work with this, I've trained my eye even more to just kind of look at the final result and say, is this what I need, yes or no? Does this look right, yes or no? And um, I think once you start moving over to this, you get a better eye for things because you actually have to judge by looking at things rather than just typing in a value and assuming it's right. So that's a little bit about how to create a basic shader. So we've used this now to create plastic. Um, don't forget, we can bring the color of the glossy down if we want to just have it shine a little bit less or we can bring the index of refraction down a little bit or the blend value on this if we wanna have less front facing um, sort of reflections on it. Again, I do a lot of stuff by eye. Um, I've learned to look at the final render and make sure that it looks good. And I would definitely advise you to do the same thing. If you wanna start practicing shading, one of the best things you could do is just grab a couple of objects that are on your desk or some, somewhere else and just try and emulate that with a shader. You don't have to model it per se, but just try it and throw some lights on there and see if you can get it to look similar. Um, because we'll teach you how to analyze looking at real world objects. And that sort of brings me into the, the next part of the tutorial, which is how I actually approach shading. And a lot of people tend to give you a really convoluted answer to this, and I'm gonna keep this very, very simple. The way I approach shading is very, very simple. Um, 
I try to replicate what's happening in the real world. So what do I mean by that? I'm gonna save my file here for a sec and turn off my render. And I'm gonna hit Control, Shift, Alt, A. I use the Blender Cloud add-on to bring in some textures and stuff. Um, if you haven't looked at this, you, you need a subscription for it, but it's really cool. So I definitely, if you like this kind of thing, I definitely would advise you to grab it and take a look at it. Now I'm gonna grab something very simple here. Let's see if I can get some very normal wood. Uh, nothing too fancy. Let's try this one, see what that says. And I'm gonna start shading the second one, bring in a new material, and it's just making a white diffuse for me. So let's shade this uh, wood texture very simply and show you what goes into it and how I approach this. So first thing I wanna do, obviously, is I wanna bring in my texture. And I grab an image texture and I'll grab the wood panel I brought in, hook it up here. And this is using the default UVs um, that were created once I uh, sort of made this object. So in your T panel, if you create a new object, now uh, for almost every object, I think in every primitive, you have the option to create UVs and they've really been improving it. So they work quite well. Um, so I'm gonna stick with these for now. I'm gonna set this UV to texture so I can scale it down. There we go. And now we just have a very basic wood texture. It's not tileable, so you'll see some seams and stuff, but I'm not too worried about that. I just wanna talk about how I approach the shading stuff. So first thing we wanna do, obviously the wood is kinda nice, but it's very flat. We need some reflections. So we're gonna do basically the same thing that I did before. Bring in a mixed shader, bring in a glossy shader. All right, there we go. And bring in the layer weight. So I'm gonna skip the Fresnel for now. I'm gonna use the layer weight because that's what I'm used to using. And um, like I said, it's good to sort of look at things visually. So this has made things a lot more interesting already. And this is where I get into the first part of how, how I sort of approach this. And um, basically when I try to look at these objects, I'm not only trying to figure out what all the different layers are. So for wood, for example, the reason the wood is reflective generally is because it has a layer of varnish on it. So this is what we're doing. We're grabbing the wood, we're giving it uh, the diffuse color that we want, and then we're adding sort of that layer of varnish on top with the glossy shader. And we're gonna try and look for a nice blend. So maybe not as, as crazy as we had, a little bit less, something like that looks quite nice. All right, so with that done, um, I've got a couple more things to, to think about. So I've got my basic setup here. Okay, it looks all right. I mean, the wood looks pretty decent. The, the, the reflection looks okay. But the problem is we're not really telling a story with this. Um, if you have a wood floor in your home or if you have a wood desk or anything else um, that is close to you that's made of wood, I suggest you pick it up and take a look at it. Because what you're doing with shading is you're not just trying to make an object look like its real world counterpart, but you're actually trying to tell a story with it. And this seems like a weird idea, but basically what I want to do is I want to make sure that it's not only wood, but it's been through some stuff. Maybe it's not 100% new. And even if you have something new, the moment you take it out of the packaging and you grab it with your hand, there's smudges on it. It's not perfect anymore. And we're trying to replicate sort of similar things in shading when we're doing that. And the best shading that you see in um, a lot of work or movies or whatever is shading that has a lot of layers of detail to it that really tells a story. So as an artist, you're trying to figure out, all right, so what happens to wood? I guess for the most part, it'll get cut, uh, it'll get scuffed, and maybe there's some fingerprints on it and things. And I'm not gonna get into the uh, nuts and bolts of making all these maps. I'm just gonna try and talk to you about how, how to think about this stuff. So generally what I'll do, if I wanna do this very quickly, um, otherwise I'll go into something like GIMP or, or Photoshop or Krita or whatever, to build my own textures. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna derive some textures from this to make this look even more interesting. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put in a color wrap. And the reason I'm doing this is if I pipe this in, this is just my diffuse texture. If I pipe this into the color ramp, then I'm gonna get black and white representation. And now generally, um, the way I look at this is all the black parts are actually the ones that have to be a little bit rough because they're a bit more indented um, and all the lighter parts with the surface. Now this isn't an exact science, it's not perfect. And if you wanna get the perfect map, then you're gonna to have to do a little bit of work yourself uh, to make this work. But the reason I'm using the color ramp is because I can flip this around very easily. And I wanna make sure that sort of the top parts are gonna be quite glossy and the bottom parts are gonna be a little bit rougher. So anything that's sort of indented. Now, with this 
uh, just brought into it. I'm going to do is plug this into the roughness. And you'll see. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to see it. Let's see if I crank this up a little bit and really mess with it. See if you can see it at all. Turn around, maybe. All right, so it's not that easy to see. And I really hope you can see it on the recording. I'm going to crank up the glossiness. Bring this down a little bit more. So this is where this map comes in really nicely. So I'm just going to increase the contrast, kind of crazy. Um, and it's not going to look 100% right. But what you'll see is that when I turn around this monkey now, you'll have a bunch of parts of the shading, sort of you'll see everything that's on top that isn't in the darker crevices is really, really shiny. And anything that's inside of the crevices is actually sort of more uh, rough and doesn't look quite as nice. So this is what I mean by telling the story. We're giving this a little bit more character already. Let me just zoom out a little bit so we can see what we're doing. There we go. Um, by doing that, you can see this wood shader has a lot more character already. If I take this out, then you'll see this becomes very bland and it's not really telling the story that we wanted to. And if I change this now, it's reacting to the texture under it and you get a lot more going on already. Now, I would always give it a little bit of roughness, just a touch, and maybe take these apart a little bit more so the um, so you can't see the contrast in them as much. But again, this is personal preference, and I advise you to, to definitely experiment with this. And nothing is ever 100% shiny, so if you have to bring this up a little bit, um, there we go. Now I have a nice variation in it. And as you can see, again, if we compare this and Okay, the texture is a little bit low res, but I'm not going to worry about that for now. If we compare this to just the flat shading, and you can see there's a lot going on there already. Now, what I want to do is sort of do the same thing again. So I'm going to bring in a color ramp and bring that in again. And this one, I want to just leave to black and white, um, but I want to boost it a little bit so I can boost the reflection. So the way the glossy shader works is anything that's plugged into this color value and we're going to take out the roughness here so we can see what's going on. Um, anything that's sort of plugged into this color value will determine where the uh, object is reflective and how reflective it is. So if I'm going to bring this up, first I'm going to preview this and bring this up, and again increase the contrast by quite a lot so you can see exactly what's going on. There we go. So now you can see as I go around the, uh, the object, and it's not the easiest thing to see, but you see it's sort of being reflective on all the lighter parts, so everything that's white in this map, and it's being non-reflective in all the darker parts. So what I want is that it's definitely reflecting um, quite quite uh, a large amount on the sort of highlighted parts where the varnish is still intact, and then in the parts where all the dark got in, so the darker parts. I want it to reflect a little bit, but not too much. Now, if I bring this roughness down, we'll see it even better. Now you'll see you can see exactly what's going on. It's reflecting in some parts of the image and not in others. Let me bring this down just a touch. There we go. And now the um, we can see the contrast. So if we plug in our roughness map into this as well, what we're going to see now is that the combination of those two makes that we have way more interesting texture. There's a lot more going on there. Now I've been fairly extreme with uh, a lot of the contrast here, so I'm going to bring it down a little bit. But again, if we compare this to what we had before, I'm going to bring the roughness back up to two because this is the standard shader. I see a lot of this in people's renders, and obviously there's nothing wrong with it um, if, if you prefer to do it this way and if you like a really clean look. But generally, if you're going to do this kind of stuff, if you add in those two maps, as you can see, suddenly this is telling way more of a story. This would, well, I'm going to call it like it is, it's seen some shit, it's old, um, there's some dirt on it, there's all kinds of stuff going on with it, and it makes for a lot more complex and interesting shading, and it sells the effect of the wood a lot better. So I bring this down even more, let's see if I can make this even smaller maybe. There we go, now we get some really interesting patterns going on, and you can see the way it reacts with the um, with the the maps and the lighting really beautifully. You get some really complex, cool looking shading. And this is looking a lot more like wood. Again, I'm gonna pull these two out so you can see the difference. There you go. This is the basic shader and this is with our, just our um, color ramp applied. So we're telling it, okay, we're gonna have light parts and white and uh, sort of darker parts and they're gonna reflect harder and less, uh, 
They're going to reflect more and less depending on the light and dark parts of the map. And this is the other way around, anything that's sort of white, so all the dark parts, which is why I flipped the map and made it white in the crevices, it's going to be quite rough, and anything around there is going to be less rough. So now, the two of them, especially if we look at it from like grazing angles and the light hits it really nicely, you get some really, really good shading and it looks amazing. Um, could you do this with the principal shader? Yes, you could, very easily. Um, I'm just going to show you as a proof of concept as well that it works just as well. Uh, set that principal shader. And here we do have an index of refraction, so it's a lot easier in use, I guess. Um, I'm going to plug in the base color here. I'm going to plug in the specular over here. So this is basically where we're saying uh, where the reflections are. It's called specular in this shader. I'm going to plug this into the roughness here, and basically we're doing the same thing. So if I hit this button, you'll see exactly the same thing is happening. Now, as you can see as well, a lot of the reflections are a lot more complex. So if you compare it here, this is very simple. Um, while if we look at this one, there's a lot more going on and it looks a lot more natural. So this is why the principal shader was introduced because there's a lot more math going on under the hood than when you build your own shaders. I still like doing it this way for control and I sort of know a lot of hacks and stuff to get around having it look the way it does. But um, let's see if we set this to multi-scatter as well. If we get similar results, we're close, but I think the principal shader gives it just that little bit more. You'll see the way the light and the reflections react with it. It looks even more natural. Now, a lot of the work that I do, especially my personal work, isn't necessarily hyper-realistic. It's more stylized, so that's why I still tend to use this method. But then again, if you prefer this and you think it looks good, then go for it. Obviously, the principal shader is uh, it's got a lot of work put into it, and it works really, really well. Um, so there we go. Looks good, right? Seems pretty interesting. Now, let's move on to the next one. And create a new little shader as well. And again, if you want more, um, and I hark back to that, if you want more sort of intricacy in your maps, then you could always go in and paint them yourself. But this is not a texturing class. Um, it's just about shading. So here we go, simple. I'm going to plug this one back in and leave the principle down here. You're going to be able to download this file and take a look at it yourself as well if you want to. All right, so now for the last one. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about another shader and how to build your own and again compare it with the one that's pre-built. So I'm going to put in the pre-built one first, the glass, and the glass shader looks really nice. I'm going to set this to GGX. Um, the reason I set this is um, this is a newer model of calculating sort of reflections and things and it looks a little bit more natural. Um, and yeah. That's just the reason I switched to it. It's more of a technical reason. It's not really, you can see the difference if you're really, really looking. Although I think most people would be hard pressed to actually notice the difference. Now, what's cool about this shader is it does all the work for you. So if I set the roughness up, you'll see it becomes sort of, um, I guess, uh, what do you call it? Frosted glass and it does this really well. Now, the problem with this is when I pull up the rough, roughness, not only the refractions, but also the reflections are actually being affected. And I would like to have my own version of that that I can control completely and do whatever I want with. And that's where uh, sort of this theory behind everything comes in again and makes it a lot easier. So I'm just going to disconnect this and put it down here. I'm going to build our own glass shader. And we're going to do the same thing that we did before. I'll bring in a mix shader. I'm going to bring in the layer weight and then I'm going to bring in the glossy first. So we're going to mix in our glossy as we did before. I'm going to set the roughness to zero for now and bring this down a little bit. There we go. And then oh, the next shader I'm going to bring in is the refraction shader. So no, I'm not going to plug that in there. I'm going to plug it in there. There we go. And now you can see if I set this one to GGX, this one to multi scatter, there we go. Now we get a very similar looking result. Um, this one is a bit brighter than the one I created. That generally has to do with the layer weight. In this case, you could also opt for using the, uh, where are we, input Fresnel, because you are dealing with glass. Um, it might be easier to use the Fresnel for this one. And I'm gonna use it just to show you that it works just as well. Um, most glass sort of is around 1.4, 1.5, the, the glass in your windows and things. Um, 
and you'll immediately see, yeah, it looks does look a little bit different, but just in case we need to do different things with it, it's nice to have this control. So what can we do now? Well, we can not only change the index of refraction of our glossiness being mixed in that it, and have it be different than our refraction, but we can also change the roughness of things separately. So now what you'll see is we actually have um, nice sharp highlights, but we have sort of a, a misty frosted glass looking uh, shader on the inside. So now we can get into more advanced effects and start doing really cool things. And this is the reason why I wanted to show you how to build this stuff yourself is um, just in case you need to step out of the realm of PVR, PBR or you want to do your own crazy things, then this is exactly what you can do. Um, so again, I can have the refraction uh, nice and nice and frosty and then the glossy in a uh, different on a different index of refraction and roughness. So if I crank this up, for example, we can get a really crystal looking thing because crystals generally have a, a higher index of refraction. Um, bring this up a little bit as well. And if you really want to get crazy, I don't know how visible this is going to be, but let's say we grab our um, let's see, Voronoi texture. What I'm going to do is I'm going to map this over the object. So now this is being mapped in 3D space. Um, and I'm going to bring the scale up just a little bit, maybe something like that. So uh, anything in the object space and the for the textures that support it, they're actually going to be mapped procedurally in 3D space on the object. So you don't need any UVs and everything is nice and seamless, which is one of the reasons I like working with it. And even if you'd need a texture, if you want to paint extra details, you could always bake it out after you feed your object uh, if you really wanted to. But this is just to show you that you can affect this stuff as well with these uh, textures. And because they're procedural, they'll actually work in 3D space inside the shaders. You can get some really, really interesting effects. So I don't want the roughness of one because it's going to be too much. But as you can see, you can already see that Voronoi texture. If I go back to it here, see this white sort of line running through it. See how the, the roughness, we let it render for a second. It's not super visible, but you can see how the roughness changes here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to really crunch this down. So you get a very outspoken effect. And you can see exactly what's happening. There we go. And now you can see we have an object that has different roughnesses on the inside. Let me just have a look at that. I'm going to turn off the ray visibility for the HDR so we can just look through the object without seeing the background. Um, obviously, it'll still be reflected, but there we go. But now you can see that map is actually affecting our internal reflections, and we can do some really cool stuff. And we still have our nice, uh, shiny external reflections as well, our surface reflections. So that's really cool. Um, it's one of the things I really like doing with these types of shaders. You can add a lot of really interesting detail into these. There we go. I can flip this around. Like I said, you can do all kinds of stuff with these to make things look more interesting. So now when we flip this around, you can see we sort of had these dots and it almost looks like there's some kind of um, weird effect going on where there's like shaded balls and things happening, uh, or I guess frosted balls happening inside the glass. So this is pretty cool, um, and it just goes to show like this the the power of building your own shaders. Um, you can go a little bit further and pull all this stuff apart. You could do something else as well, and you could have your glossy uh, reflections have a different color, and the inside have another different color. But I'll get it back into that in just a second. But this Rafael uh, Fresnel as well, we can even put a color ramp in here because honestly, this is just a two D texture. So if we want to have sort of iridescent or crazy reflections, we could use this in here. And what you'll see now is that the color doesn't really do anything. But if I change this one back to blue and I change the other one to, let's say, a red kind of color. Now the uh, color will change depending on the angle of the reflection. So we get a nice sort of blue and just take this one out. So we just have the reflection itself. Go. Maybe bring in the blue a little bit. There you go. As you can see, if you're doing sort of things like car paint and everything, um, you can get some really, really cool results with this by just using the Fresnel or the layer weight, depending on what you prefer using, and cranking it up. So if I bring this up, then everything will turn blue because obviously we have our um, wider color or lighter color at the front. If you look at this, uh, which is being piped into the blue here, so everything is turning blue now. Um, and if I bring this back down, everything that's sort of black or dark gray is going to be red. And you can see that happening. Now there's a lot less blue and a lot more red. Um, but because we're mixing them in as Fresnel reflections, if we do it normally like this, what you'll see is that 
Changing the Fresnel will also change the amount of mixing happening between the two colors. So this is why I do things manually. Um, I've, no, I, I've said it a couple of times before now, but you get so much more control. And once you start understanding how a lot of these work, you can start doing some really cool things with them, which is exactly what we want. Um, I like to get super, super creative with shading. And um, this is these are the tools that allow me to do so. When I switched from other renderers to cycles, this is what blew my mind because I was like, hey, I can build my own shaders from scratch. I don't have to use code. I can just do it myself and I can do it visually. And uh, that brings me on to one more thing here, and that is building your own shaders. So before I do that, let's go in uh, and let's go into this one to do sort of one last overview of what we did. We have the diffuse being blended with the glossy, and then we have our color ramp, which is going from black to white, uh, which is controlling how reflective our object it is uh, in certain places. And we have the roughness, which works um, sort of from black to white. For me, it's it's the other way around because I'm used to shading it uh, the other way around from other render, render engines, but it doesn't really matter. So anything that's white is going to be rough, but we want the black or the darker parts of our images, um, which generally are going to be like the crevices in the wood here, to be more rough, which is why, I'm, why we're switching this around. Um, then we pipe that into the color and the roughness. We blend it all together using the layer weight, using the Fresnel, and now we get a nice little wood shader, or we can do the same thing using the principled shader which gives us slightly more realistic and PBR um, results compared to this one. The results are very, very, uh, I guess, subtle, the differences, but if you know what you're looking for, then, then you might be able to spot it. That being said, I use these depending on the situation. Um, same with this one. I'm gonna put the glass back in here and I'm gonna pipe the Fresnel in here as well. And if you wanna reroute stuff ever, hit the reroute button and then you can clean up your node tree a little bit to make things a little bit more clear. So rather than just being stuck with the glass, um, we have our glass shader with different roughness inside uh, for the refraction, different roughness for the uh, glossiness. We have crazy colors going on. Um, I'm going to bring in the red a little bit more here just to show you. There we go. So we've got front facing red reflections and, and grazing angle um, blue reflections, which is really cool. Uh, compared that to the glass shaders, all of a sudden, while it works really, really well, and it's perfect for quick and simple glass solutions, if that's all you need. Um, if you want to get a little crazy and more inventive, then this is the way to go. Now, um, I'm going to talk about one more thing about the glass and we move on to the, I think, last or second to last uh, part. And um, one thing we haven't done yet, if if I do just bring in this glass shader, actually, I shouldn't have thrown it out. And I want to talk a little bit more about um, how to create colored glass. Now, most people will just kind of do this, bang, colored glass, done. Now, the problem with this is because this is piped into the surface slot of the materials, what's actually happening is it's just coloring everything that is getting red and spitting it back out. And it looks really flat and really weird. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the saturation back down and uh, I'm going to make sure that we're coloring this glass correctly because what's happening when we have colored glass? Um, I know when I do this in, in classes, um, just in a normal classroom, and I tell people, everybody remembers that that green or blue glass vase that your grandmother had that either had a bunch of candy in it or a bunch of knickknacks in it. And that's exactly what we're going to try and do. We're going to try and make that glass look similar to that, that really dark sort of glass. Um, what you might remember about it, if uh, the next time you're there, have a look at it and um, pick it up and look at it in the light. And what you'll notice is that sort of the thinner parts of the mesh would be, uh, which in our case would be the ears, are going to be a little bit lighter in color than the thicker parts of the mesh. And if we just do this, uh, again, let's go for the green look, then we're not really seeing any difference. Everything's sort of the same green, um, except for like the reflections and stuff and the refractions here. But this is sort of a lot thinner than this and this, and this should be a lot darker. And actually this just doesn't look right. So this is another mistake I see a lot of people make, and that's because we're getting into the next part of the tutorial, which is volume shading. And volume shading isn't just about creating mist, but you can do a lot of really interesting things with it once you know what you're doing. So the next thing I'm gonna bring in is this volume absorption. I'm gonna pipe that into the volume shader, and the first thing you're gonna see is it gets a little bit darker. What I like to do is I'm gonna set the green here, I'm gonna set that dark green, and what you can see is happening now uh, is exactly what I was talking about. These thicker parts of the mesh are actually becoming green and these 
other ones aren't uh, being affected as much. So if we bring the density up quite a bit, we're gonna have to do this quite extreme. Now we get uh, what's looking like really dark green glass and it actually looks correct. So as you can see, the lighter parts of the mesh generally are colored slightly brighter and the darker parts of the mesh are, are looking a little bit better. I'll set this back to GGX. Uh, again, this is just because I, I like working um, with this, this stuff, but um, it just looks a lot better. It looks a lot nicer. Again, if we bring the color up a little bit and it's a little bit brighter, then we can mess with it a little bit more. But as you can see, let's compare this to just dumping this into the green. This is what we get, which looks really, really weird. And let's see if we can reset this to the default value. Nope. Point nine six, I believe, is the default on this one. I'm gonna bring up the alpha. So um, we saw what happened with the green. So if I pipe in the volume here, this looks a lot better, a lot more natural. And then we could even combine it with our own shader. And now we can get this really crazy shader that has different internal refractions, has glossy, really glossy reflections. Um, that are colored either blue or red, depending on the angle that you're looking at it. And the glass itself has volume absorption in it, making it look completely green. So if you're still wondering why I do stuff uh, on my own and why I do do this kind of thing, it's because a, lo a little bit of technical know-how definitely goes a long way into creating things that look really cool and really realistic. Now, um, now that we've talked a little bit about volume rendering, I wanna get into that a little bit more and just show you exactly what it does. So I'm gonna, let's see, go back here and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a little round cube, I'm gonna scale it up and I'm gonna bring it forward and make sure one of my monkeys here is inside the round cube. Now I'm gonna put some subdivisions on it and smooth it out so we just have a nice smooth sphere and bring in a new shader and throw out the diffuse because we're just going to focus on volume shading for now. Now I've done a tutorial about volumetrics and how to make them look cool so I'm not going to talk about too much today but I'm just going to talk about a couple of ones that work really well and again if you want to do volumetrics this is volume scatter um, and you'll see it just scatters the light and you get sort of a mist effect and you can do cool stuff with it. If you want more info on how to how to do crazy things with these, um, just look at the other tutorial uh, in this series and it'll do a lot of explaining and you can get along just fine. Now, um, I'm gonna skip this one. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the volume absorption. So let's see. So this is what we saw before. What it's gonna do is it's actually just gonna absorb uh, and color volume that you're doing. So this is what we use for the glass. And as you can see, this is exactly what it's doing. It absorbs the light. So um, the light rays are trying to get through, but after a while, they actually get darker and darker and darker. And we get, we hit sort of that color, which is really cool. Now, um, I use this for a bunch of different stuff. I'm just gonna disconnect it for now. And uh, I'm gonna hide that round cube for a sec. I'm gonna add something else in, something very simple. Add a cube. And the reason I'm doing this stuff will become quite clear in just a second. Move it back, move it down just a bit. There we go. And I'm just gonna add a wireframe modifier to it. Give it a fair thickness, there we go. And uh, crease the edges and add subdivision surface. Now now this is, now I know this is really high dense, uh, very dense mesh, but um, I just wanted to show you very quickly what I'm doing with this. So first thing I'm gonna do is throw this out after making a new shader. I'm gonna add in an emission shader. There we go. And what I'm gonna do first is stick it into the surface shading. So what happens, I'm gonna set this to 10 and give it a cool little color, maybe something yellow. There we go. Now it's lighting up our scene. So emission shaders, I do a lot of really fun stuff with emission shaders. And um, the reason I wanted to show you this trick is because you can do some really, really interesting things with it. Now, the emission shader, when you use it in the um, in the surface slot, then everything sort of, it really flattens out. You won't have, excuse me, you won't have any shading on the, um, 
on the mesh itself. And like I said, it looks really, really flat. It just looks like a bunch of lines drawn over top your render. Now, the first thing I want to touch on very quickly is if I render this really, really easily, um, really quickly and easily, dang round cube, there we go. So let it render for a sec. And if you can hear my computer in the background, my apologies, it's, uh, it gets quite noisy when I'm rendering uh, the GPUs or pushing out a lot of heat. So there we go. So one thing I wanna to touch on very briefly as well is that you, um, you do your shading with compositing in mind. And this might sound a little bit weird, but I see a lot of people making some the same mistakes over and over again because they don't realize there's a second step to everything. And in the case of shading and rendering, compositing really is a second step. Um, trying to get stuff out of a render engine, I see it more and more frequently that people are like, yeah, I just need a little bit here, a little bit there, and, and I'm done. Um, some render engines have some really good tools built in, like a little bit of color correction and, and bloom and glare and all that. But generally what you're gonna do is after you render something, you're almost always gonna do just even a little bit of post-production just to make the render pop a little bit. Um, that being said, if you have a bad render, you can post production, do post-production all day. It's not gonna look better. It's just gonna look like something um, that you tried to look better. So something I tell my students, uh, crap in is crap out, and that's just the way it is with compositing as well. If your render isn't that great to begin with, it's not gonna be that great even after you spend two hours within compositing. But what I wanna talk about is that you do shading with compositing or post-production in mind. So what do I mean by that? Well, I render this image now, I'm gonna load it into my uh, image viewer. There we go. And we can see it here. And I'm gonna switch over to the Blender compositor, hit use nodes, and now we can see our end result being composited in. So we have an emission thing here, and this is a really simple example of that. If I add in a glare filter here, and I just set it to fog glow, then now this is actually gonna look like it's emitting light. And this is exactly what I mean by think about your compositing step when you're shading. Don't try and figure out really hacky ways of making this light up in, in Blender itself and cycle by using volumes and doing weird things. There's really no point to it. You can do this in one simple step and you're done. You don't have to do anything else. And because of this value over here, if we look down at the bottom here, because our actually our values over here are um, above one, so that means they're actually brighter than white, the glow threshold, uh, which is one, is gonna grab everything that's higher than one, and it's just gonna make everything glow and look, make it look all right. You can even see a little bit of subtle blooming on the side here. And Blender's Glare plugin, uh, although it's not super advanced, uh, it, does, it does a really nice job, and I think it gives you really, really nice results. But that's just what I mean by have your compositing in mind. If you know you're gonna do certain steps or certain color corrections, then don't try and fidget around too much in the shading um, and try and get it done, or just render a mask or something like that and uh, and do it in compositing. Now, it's gonna go back to shading because this isn't a compositing episode. I just wanted to, there we go, get back to it and show you something. There's a difference uh, in how you can get this to look. For example, if I pipe this into the volume slot, you'll see this is starting to look a lot more like a hologram. Um, you're gonna have to use a lot more strength to make it look right. And this gets a lot, lot noisier than using it in, uh, using it in the surface slot, which can introduce quite a bit of noise as well. Um, but it's just uh, this just goes to show. There we go. And the cool thing about this is you can see it mixes a lot nicer with the stuff behind it. So if I go in here, you see it's still sort of semi-transparent and you get more of a sort of hologram looking effect. And it's something I wanted to touch on because once you figure this kind of stuff out, your the look of your renders is just gonna go, just gonna start blowing up exponentially. It's gonna look a lot better because you start understanding that there's a difference between volume and surface shading. And the reason I wanted to bring in that round cube now, if I bring that back, I bring the volume absorption in here, uh, a neat little trick that I like to use is set this sort of to dark, quite a dark color um, without any saturation, so sort of dark gray or whatever. And if I'm doing a lot of work with holograms and just holograms, um, for example, if I bring this in here and I bring this down to 0 0.5, I'm just gonna add a solidify to this very quickly so we can see what we're doing. bring it in here 
here we go and uh, like I've been doing a lot of UI and hologram stuff lately and the cool thing is um, if you're just using this in a black space obviously we can see this but if I turn the studio floor off now what you can do with this volume absorption is sort of control the fall off of your um, of your holograms so this is a neat little trick uh, that I wanted to show you but Again, there's a difference between surface and volume shading, and it's really important to know the difference. Obviously, this is cutting off the ears, and I would only use it in case of um, in case of a hologram on its own, sort of in an empty area. But it just goes to show that you can do some really neat things once you understand the difference between these two. Um, I think that's about it for me. So I'm going to turn this back on, and I'm going to turn this round cube off. Uh, I'm going to leave this the way it is so you can have a look at it yourself. And I'm going to end this very quickly with um, two shaders that I built myself that I can show you very quickly how to group them and how to make nodes out of them um, and what the use is. So if you want to make a custom shader, I'm going to do something very simple here. Uh, let's say I'm going to shader, I'm going to mix this, I'm going to mix, oh, come on, I'm going to mix this. Actually, I'm going to change this to an add shader so we can do it correctly. So I'm going to add the volume absorption and the volume scatter together here. So we're adding these two, and now we get this really cool smoke looking shader. Um, but let's say I want to use this, I want to reuse this, and I want to do it quickly, and I want both of these to always be the same color and link them together. What I can do is grab these three shaders, hit Control G, and it'll group them. And now what you'll see is we get a group input and a group output. So we have this node group, and because there's nothing in the input, we can't really control anything. But if we grab this color, we can control the color from the same, same place. And let's say we want to control the density as well from the same place, or uh, not with the color, but actually with a new node. So by dragging a new one in here, we go. Um, yeah, I'm not going to get too deep into it. Uh, I'm just going to show you very quickly. It has default values, so if we want the default value to be the standard blender, sort of grayish white, um, and we have a density here that goes from 0 to, let's say, 10, and the default value is 1. If we go back out of this group, now we have our own little note group, and we can give this all names and stuff. I'll show you in just a second. Uh, we can control this, so we control the color of the two shaders now, so they're working together, and we can bring the density down of both the shaders. So this is a very, very quick example of how to create your own custom shader. And I've been getting to this more and more, and I have two that I use almost on a daily basis at this point when I'm trying to do a lot of really, really weird artwork. And I'm going to show you them very quickly and include them in the file as well. So I'm just going to do this on the surface of the, um, of the round cube. And you can bring them in, and I have my mHollow which is a hologram shader that I've been working on for quite some time, um, which might actually be a bit better off to use for the thingies over here. And uh, no, actually I'm gonna demo it on this one, so it's a little bit more clear. And this shader has been in the works for the last couple of weeks, I guess. Um, I keep adding stuff to it, and uh, it's never gonna be finished, I guess, but I just wanna show you very quickly what you can do it. With it. So this is a very simple hologram shader. I'm going to turn off this round cube and I'm literally just going to grab this by itself. And the first thing you might notice is that we get sort of a nice hologram look. Now, when you use it as surface shader, um, you've got a bunch of options that you can use, but you can also use it as volume shader if you want to. And you'll see the same thing. Uh, you get really, really interesting results. I switch between the two depending on what I need, but there's some stuff that only works in surface mode, uh, which I'm going to show you very quickly. So, for example, I have the opacity, and I can bring in a mask as well to have my opacity masked over the surface. Uh, let's say I bring in, where is it, the um, Fornoid texture again, bring it into the mask, and you'll see it'll actually mask the shader out and it'll become transparent. Um, then it has a Fresnel option, so you can actually have it Fresnel in and out, uh, make it look correct, and you can change the bias a little bit. This is a uh, link to a layer weight, which I'll just show in just a sec. So there you go. You can see it happening in real time. Then I've got a switch to turn on the back facing. So now we can actually see the back facing polygon. So you get a really nice, interesting result. Um, and if we turn it on, you can see through them. So you get sort of weird results. And if I turn off the Fresnel mix, then what you'll see is that you see the front and the back mixing together. If I take this away, this is just the front facing um, 
front facing polygons, which is cool. And then for the last one, I'm gonna go back into my scene. Uh, this is the lighting. I can turn lighting on and off. And I found that this, if I turn the strength up to like say 50, this can really drastically improve noise and stuff in my image. And sometimes I just want this to look like a flat surface. Um, there we go. And any one of them with the S uh, don't work, uh, only work in surface mode, but the lighting, for example, does work in the volume mode. So you can have emissive volumes that don't light up, uh, so you don't have a crazy noisy image and nice sort of good looking holograms and reflections. Now, the reason I'm showing you this, and I'm just gonna turn off the render here, is this is what the shader looks like internally. And it might seem a little bit crazy, and you can look at this uh, at your own leisure. I'm not gonna explain the whole thing. But basically what I'm doing is I had this workflow that I built around a couple of basic shaders where I was hiding stuff here and there. And it all started with taking away the lighting and being able to control a few little bits and bobs here and more. And then I just sort of kept adding on to it. So here we see all the inputs uh, that you see, color, strength, opacity, opacity, mask, Fresnel mix, Fresnel bias, Fresnel normal, back facing and lighting. And um, here we see everything that's going on within the shader. Now, obviously none of this is PBR and physically correct and all that. Um, I like having these shaders because they allow me to, uh, to work very, very quickly and do some really interesting things with them. So they're included in the file. Um, have a look at them yourself if you want to. I'll apply it to the, uh, I'll take away the emission here and I'll just apply a basic one. Where are we? And hollow 150 strength. Change the color here to so do it properly. Come on, there we go. And we have the full shader. And again, there you go. Um, if I turn on the lighting, you'll see the bottom here lights up, um, but anything else reflections, anything else is in there and it works just fine. So the other one I wanna take a very quick look at is I'm gonna drop that in here because we had a little glass shader, is the dispersion. Now this one is incredibly slow. I really wouldn't recommend using this in production and I'm sure uh, some people who are even more knowledgeable than I am uh, about this stuff are gonna cringe at the way I did this because if we look at this one, it's even crazier. It's a giant mix. Um, but the reason I, I approached it like this and just have a look at them, like I said, don't, don't freak out if they seem really, really intricate because I built them as I went along. Every time I needed a feature, I went back in, sort of tried to make it work and build them piece by piece, which is the reason why they, they, they look so complex now, but I was able to build them quite easily. Now, the reason I wanted this, because I wanted to have different um, controls for the refractions and, well, refractions and reflections, which is the reason why I built the shader uh, before myself. Um, and again, I have a layer weight mix. So this is uh, same as you would use layer weight to mix the reflections and refractions. And I control this stuff. And the delta here is actually what controls the internal dispersion for the refraction or controls the dispersion for the reflections as well. And you can get these really crazy, crazy results. But again, noise, noise, noise. This is not a very optimized shader. Um, if anybody pulls this apart and is like, hey, I can optimize this, please let me know. Uh, I'd be happy to, uh, to incorporate it and update it and get it out to everybody. But it just goes to show, once you start building your own shaders, there's really nothing that's holding you back. And I mean, before it was this nice little cleaned up palette, I mean, I was working with this thing all day and tweaking values and, and making sure they worked and everything. And then I was like, I'm sick of having to rebuild things every time I need to use this or bring it in from a different, um, a different file. So what I did, just built this into a group, made my own group. And if you hit the F, little, little F button, after you've brought it into your start file and you save the start file, this is a fake user, so this will save that group even though it's an empty, uh, sort of an empty, uh, empty Blender file. So I can show you that very quickly. If I start a Blender and I just switch over to the node view. So this is my startup file. I haven't really changed much uh, except for some of the defaults that I really like. But as you can see, oh, I'm gonna need a new object first. So I'm just gonna create a plane. Go back to the node editor. So if I create a new um, new material here, I can go into the group and there they are, the M dispersion and M hollow. Obviously, I'm gonna add more uh, as, I, as I go along, but this just goes to show it's incredibly powerful to do your own stuff and, and do really interesting things. So this was a very a lot longer than I expected it to be. If you're still here, thanks for sticking with me. Um, have a look at the different shaders. I'm gonna see if I can 
Now, um, so I'm going to leave these in. The M hollow and M dispersion are in there as well, uh, if you want to have a look at them. And you can study this file and play around with it and do different things. And um, that's it. So what did we do today? We just looked at the basic shading, how to create a basic shader. Um, with all the techniques that I showed you or with the principled shader, you can do anything that's glass, metal, pretty much any of any object that's around you uh, that you can think of, you could do with those shaders. Um, one more thing that I'll probably get into in the next lesson, because um, it's it's been going on too long now, is how we can layer extra stuff. So we can layer glossy shaders on top of each other to make car paint materials, for example, which have multiple glossy components. And uh, we're gonna look at that a little bit in the next class. But I really hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, actually had a really good time making it. I can't believe it's already an hour. Uh, so I'm gonna keep this short. I'll see you for the next Shading Shenanigans, which is gonna be, like I said, a lot more procedural stuff and get really into depth. And uh, that's it. So thanks for watching this one. See you soon.